Good evening, everyone. Welcome to The Truth Pursuit. Uh, this is going to be awesome. I am so excited for this. This is an idea that uh, I proposed to Corey a few weeks ago, and it has developed into what we think is going to be a great segment for the podcast. Um, tonight's inaugural topic uh, for this segment is going to be a little bit longer than, than the, the segment will typically run during an ISM show. Um, maybe it'll run five, ten minutes, but... Tonight, we're going to try and go 30, 35 minutes just to, just to have a little fun with it. And for tonight's inaugural topic, since it's going to be longer, um, we thought that we would have a little fun with it. So what could be more fun than the flood of Noah? Uh, my idea for this segment is to bring up a topic weekly on the ISM show um, that we can uh, interact with the audience on, that I can interact with the audience on uh, Twitter and uh, Periscope throughout the week. So we're not going to really be delving into it typically during the week when we have a show, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it, but I just want to bring up the topic and then just engage with the audience throughout the week on Twitter, getting thoughts and uh, arguments for, arguments against, any ideas, memes, whatever. Just, just have fun with it. And um, that's what we're going to do tonight. Um, you can follow me at... El Duderino, E-L-D-U-D-E-I-R-E-N-O, on Twitter and Periscope. That's all caps. You can follow Corey at Dopinephrine. Um, follow the show on Twitter and Periscope at ISM Podcast underscore. And um, you can listen live on blogtalkradio.com forward slash informed podcast. Uh, tonight's episode is not on Periscope, but our usual shows on Wednesday nights are always broadcast on there. If you would like to contribute to the show, please do so at patreon.com forward slash inform podcast. Tonight's show is not being charged. Only the two-hour Wednesday episodes will be charged. Uh, the show always airs at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 Central, 6 Mountain, which is 5 on the West Coast, Wednesdays on Blog Talk Radio. All episodes are available on iTunes for download or streaming. If you want to call us up and be on the air, phone number is 646 646- Five six four nine five five one. So uh, I'm excited about this. Let's go right into it. Corey, how are you doing tonight? I am doing fantastic. This is uh, this is such a brilliant idea. Um, I, when you first brought this up, I was really excited at the prospects of it, and then uh, to to actually uh, have the opportunity to work with you more consistently uh, as the co-host is also, of course, very very exciting. Uh, I think this is going to be a really, really neat way to kind of extend outside of just the two-hour Wednesday show, but to actually engage with people beyond that uh, as, uh, as you do periscopes and, and, and tweet some things uh, throughout the rest of the week. I think this is a fantastic opportunity for our audience, uh, and it's going, to be, it's going to be a lot of fun moving forward. Oh, I, I'm absolutely stoked for it. I, I had a lot of fun when I first got on Twitter and the, the uh, secular community on Twitter is just fantastic, and I learned so much over the last, like, three years on there. And i just, you know, been, been trying to find a way to get back involved because with the things that I've been doing recently, I've kind of not periscoped as much recently or not been tweeting as much, and I really wanted to get back into it. And I thought, how do I get, how do I get in there with some kind of a plan? and some kind of a goal. And then when this opportunity to, to co-host with you came up and uh, I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart, I, I am honored to be on the show permanently now. And I just want to, just want to have some fun. So um, yeah, I want to bring up these topics, have some discussions. If um, people can answer questions that I don't know, that'd be great. Send me those. If, if you, if you have more questions that maybe I could answer, ask those. If you just want to put memes, put those. But tonight we're going to talk about Noah's Flood. And it's so much fun. <laughs> Noah's Flood. <laughs> uh, I suppose it's not his flood. He was just in it. It's God's right. <laughs> Flood. <laughs> God's Flood, really. Yeah, technically. But, um, yeah, I guess uh, we'll just, just hop right into it here. Um Noah's flood takes place in Genesis um, chapter six through nine carries that narrative. And there's a lot of information in there uh, about it. And it seems to 
us counter apologists and secular minded people that a lot of it doesn't add up. A lot of it just doesn't seem possible. To say, so, uh, to say the least, the, yeah. the, the amount of problems here, I actually had some fun because uh, we talk a lot with people, uh, as you were saying, in the, in the secular community, in the atheist community, in the free thinking community, at least, uh, at least the, the small one uh, that we have located uh, and been members of um, uh, on various uh, social media platforms. And I have talked to I don't know how many people who Noah's Ark gave them their first introduction to doubt. Um, some of yes. some of the, the the cleverest skeptics I've ever met can trace all the way back to well, I was nine years old and I went to Sunday school and they told us about Noah's flood, uh, Noah's flood. I even even I'm doing it. Noah's Ark and the, <laughs> and the flood sent by God and. I started asking questions and they couldn't really answer them. The mind of a child is a remarkable thing. Um, it's, it's odd that the that childhood is where your imagination is flourishing. It's where these magical ideas of fantastic events can really be fostered. And yet it's the, it's the critical thinking of a young person going, wait a minute, wait a minute, all of this water showed up and, 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 and there's an <laughs> what now animals on it. They, that's when the seeds of doubt begin to uh, begin to be born. Some of my, uh, uh, my closest colleagues in the, in the secular world can trace their skeptic tendencies all the way back to their introduction to this particular story. Uh, your, your co-host on the um, recent Obama episode is one of those. Yep. Yep. That's when um, Chuck uh, at Jotnar, friend of the show, uh, he talks about being in Sunday school at like 10 or 12 and going, Wayne, this is, this is some bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I guess maybe before we start, um, there might be some people who just don't know about Noah's flood. Now I know that seems not very probable. Most people know, unless you've been stranded on an ark out the sea for several years <laughs> you should have probably heard about this but the 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 basic gist of it is god was upset wanted to kill everybody on the planet wipe out his creation decided that noah and his family were good enough to be spared and um allowed for them to take a few of the animals that were on the planet, a few of each kind of animals that were on the planet with them so that they could all repopulate the, from their, their goodness, their wholesomeness after the, the waters had subsided. So he, he orders Noah to build an ark, uh, sends animals to Noah when it's completed and they climb on and off they go. Uh, as I said, it takes place, Genesis 6 through 9. And uh, in Genesis 6.15, there's the actual measurements of the ark. Uh, let me just read that here. It says, uh, and this is from the, um, the Holy Bible, uh, King James Version Dictionary Study Bible. And it says, um, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. The breadth of it shall be 50 cubits and the height of it 30 cubits. Um, now, if you aren't familiar with the measurement of a cubit, it's a, a measurement that was used in a lot of ancient cultures around that, that uh, time. And it is the length from the bottom of your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. So it's going to vary person to person. Uh, I used um, the measurement of mine, which is like 19 and a half. And I just kind of rounded it to 20 inches. And so that makes the uh, arc 500 feet long and 83 feet wide. Uh, could you, Corey, give us a little perspective, like a couple other ships that the size of them so we can maybe see that in our minds? Sure. Yeah. When we're dealing with cubits, uh, you're dealing with this, this antiquated, this antiquated measurement. I love, by the way, that you took the time to measure your own arm. Um, that never once did that occur to me to actually, I just, I just Googled how, how long is a cubic, uh, a cubit. I love that. Um, that's, uh, that's, uh, I mean, I should have, I, I don't know why that didn't occur to me, but in any case, um, the, so the arc is about 500 feet long. Um, 
when we're talking about about how big that that sounds pretty big, five hundred feet. That's pretty impressive, um, and that would have been especially remarkable, uh, you know, four thousand years ago. Um, oh yeah. In order to get this get this in your heads, uh, the Titanic, classic classic example of a, of a big ship, was 883 feet long, um, so about uh, about 380 feet longer than the Ark, and uh, an aircraft carrier uh, used by the U.S. Navy today, um, the standard aircraft carrier used by the United States is 1,092 feet long, a little a little more than two arcs, uh, nose to nose. Uh, an aircraft carrier is still longer than two arcs. Okay, so this is a pretty big ship, 500 feet long. Um, <clears throat> now, just right off the bat, I think I'm running into trouble with, uh, I'm thinking about an aircraft carrier, and they're pretty big. You can get quite a few jet fighters on them, some helicopters, crew, crews of, of, of a couple thousand, I imagine. I, I don't know exactly, but I'm not sure that two of every kind of animal would fit on it. My my gut says no. Um, yeah, the, you can get a couple of thousand. Uh, when the Titanic went down, uh, hundreds of people survived that, but it took over fifteen hundred people with it uh, into the depths. Um, so you can you can fit, and that's and that's smaller than an aircraft carrier. I think you can get like right. eighty jets on an aircraft carrier. You can fit a lot of people on there. Um, but if we're going to talk about if we're going to talk about two of every kind of animal, good God, that's that's yeah. that's. I mean, you can't you can't even hardly represent a number that large. Now, um, from what I understand, there are apologists who say that they only needed two of every type. Have you heard this argument? Uh, Where I have. It 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 falls apart a little bit immediately because, and and I don't want to jump ahead too much. I, I I'm interjecting a little bit here, but at at no, one point we end up talking about both ravens and doves. Right. So at least he's not. It's it's not like he just took two birds. Obviously, there's a difference between doves and ravens. Um, somebody did the math, and I've I've gone and foolishly not kept it in front of me. Um, we're still talking about thousands of types of animals, and uh, somebody clever than clever cleverer than I did the math on um, on insects and said that if you were to break it down to kind, you'd still be looking at about two million species of insects. Yeah, I mean just insects alone. And, and you're running into uh, space problems. But these ships that we're talking about that we're comparing the size to, these are the, the Titanic and aircraft carriers. These are modern ships. These are iron and steel. And the, the, the Ark was a wooden ship. Uh, gopher wood, I believe, is what Genesis says it is made out of. Yeah, and, gopher um, Yeah. Um. The largest wooden ship ever built was the Wyoming. It's named after the state that we live in, Corey. Um, yeah, good luck there. Of, uh, Governor uh, Bryant Butler Brooks was uh, one of the investors for the ship, which cost about $175,000 when it was built in 1909. Um, it was overall length of let me just get this here. 450 feet long, and it was 50 feet wide. Now, this was built in 1909 when they had pretty much mastered wooden shipbuilding. Sure. I mean, these were the best at it. And the problem that the Wyoming had, and it's going to be hard to kind of visualize this, you're hearing this audio, but the, the Wyoming was so long that it would twist uh port to starboard like the the stern would twist to the to the starboard as the as the bow would you know i'm not port but the bow would twist to the port and it would twist back and forth and this would cause gaps in the uh six inch plankings and then those gaps would rush with water and the crew would have to pump water out constantly and so to try and fix this they uh they put in um a number of iron cross beams to try and support it. Um, something like, let me just find it here, 80 cross beams, um, angle iron to, to try and keep it from twisting. And 
You know, it, it served for a few years, 1909 to 1924. But on March 11, 1924, it uh, it sank. It came apart, broke apart, and sank, and a crew of 14 was lost. Now, this was a ship, the largest wooden ship ever built by master shipbuilders, and it was too big. It was too big for a wooden ship, and it they, they recognized it, and they tried to reinforce it with iron, and it still wouldn't hold together. So they had the benefit of... First off, metal. They could they could use metal to reinforce this. They also had pumps um, in order to pump that water out. None of these technologies, of course, existed during the days of the Ark. Right. And the Ark is 50 feet longer than the Wyoming. <laughs> so right here, I'm running into some troubles already. The, you know, have you heard about this... Um, this tablet, it's at the, I think it's at the, the British Museum. Um, it's a cuneiform tablet, much older than the Book of Genesis. Um, it's from the Mesopotamia regions. And in uh, the guy that, uh, somebody from the public, uh, their, their, their father had this. He brought it home like during World War II, I think. Um, I don't know where he got it, but this, this guy came and brought it to a... Um, uh, scientist. He's one of the few experts on the planet today who can understand uh, cuneiform because it's you know a dead text it, that nobody uses it anymore. But this person does understand it, and so this person figured out that it was cuneiform, brought it to this expert, gave it to him. It's now in the in the British Museum, and uh, it's been authenticated by several um, researchers. It details something very very similar to the Ark story, just on this little. It's kind of like a, it looks like a brick. And somebody pressed probably, you know, like uh, when it was soft clay, somebody pressed using cuneiform um, all of this text into this into this brick. And it basically describes a similar story to the flood story, and it includes very specific instructions on how to build the ark. In fact, much more specific than Genesis gives us. It has more measurements. It talks about how much pitch will be needed. It talks about how much rope will be needed. And it very clearly describes the ark as being round. In Mesopotamia and the surrounding regions at the time, they would make these uh, – think, think of a shallow basket. They would weave them out of, uh, out of like, um, like, like rope, almost like flax, and they would wrap them around uh, a wooden, um, uh, a wooden like a skeleton. They would wrap this rope all around it very, very, very tightly and then paint it with pitch. Uh, and then you could like sit in that like a bowl and you could you could get a paddle and you would use that for crossing the rivers and whatnot. This brick seems to suggest that the original one of the older rather I shouldn't say original one of the older ark stories actually says it should be massive like Noah's Ark is claimed to have been, uh, but that it needed to have been um, completely round. Oh, that is interesting. I hadn't heard that before. I, I, I've heard of it depicted as a uh, like rectangle like just a just a long box uh, as a matter of fact that's the way um, it was depicted in the the latest Noah movie um, yeah the uh, Darren Aronofsky flick yeah yeah so um, you know uh, I suppose that the the round one would maybe fare better in the twisting department but I don't I don't know how big of a bowl you would need to to put two of every kind of animal in. And if you had a giant bowl, then you're obviously, I mean, that means the Genesis is wrong. Genesis does not describe a bowl. Genesis describes right. um, something exactly. rectangular. Um, I just kind of wanted to bring up a few points so that we can have um, things to talk about during the week. And so one of, uh, one of the ones is uh, right in the beginning of the story. In, uh, in Genesis 6, uh, 1 through 6, it speaks of um, the sons of God and that they were attracted to the daughters of men and that they, uh, they, they would mate with them and have children and this was like sort of the starting of bringing about the wickedness that, that God was upset with. And um, it says in uh, Genesis 6, 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. 
and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. Giants, Corey. Straight up giants, man. I wonder what what made a giant in biblical times, because as far as I knew, in biblical times, weren't people much shorter in stature than they are now? Much shorter. Um, the the historical record and anthropology tells us as much. Um, man has grown taller mostly because man has gotten healthier. Um, humans of antiquity were more or less the same. I mean, Species-wise, they were identical. Uh, they would have had the same DNA and, you know, five five fingers on each hand and everything else would have been the same, but um, they were, they were much shorter. Part of that was due to uh, good old fashioned malnutrition, but yeah, humans in general in this time period, um, I've heard as low as, as four feet would have been an average person, uh, an average adult um, up to, uh, to maybe scraping around the the four foot 10 um, area, uh, perhaps a little bit taller, a, a giant, I think, um, might be might be somebody our height. If we could go back and meet Noah, we might have been seen as giants. That's very true. Uh, uh, yeah, and um, this just brought something else to mind that I don't even know why I didn't think of it earlier, but uh, that would make for much shorter cubits. Oh my goodness, you are absolutely right. So you 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 may have a, a smaller ship that might not have the problem with the twisting, but then you're going to have a a bigger problem with fitting the animals. So you, right. they're going to have to pick their poison here on on how that goes. That's a brilliant now, observation. Um, I ju- it just came to my head just now as we were talking about it. Uh, now, speaking of cubits, though, Genesis 7.20 says that, um, you know, when the water started and it started to rain and, and the, the ark's lifting up, or um, as you told me earlier, that maybe it, it just stayed under for a while and then and popped up later like a like a fish bobber or something um that at a certain point it rose another 15 cubits or 25 feet and covered the mountains and and that's when everything was at last covered and you had mentioned something about that when uh, i was talking about that earlier today uh what was that well Okay, we are talking about water. Water is something that we are familiar with. Um, water, if you pour it into a container, will, will calibrate. It will even out. It will fill its container in an even way, right? This is, this is like middle school. Um, it doesn't it – doesn't, it'll, 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 it'll stay – it has an even depth. So if you, if you are covering the tallest mountains on earth by an extra, by an extra bit, by an extra so many feet, then the water is going to be uniformly deep uh, relative to its surface. You're going to have places where the distance between the, the top of the mountain and the surface of the water is not very much, but it's going to be, the water is going to be evenly, evenly uh, deep from, the, from, the, from, from sea level, let's say. So you've got water globally that is taller than the tallest mountains, we're talking somewhere in the ballpark of about 20,000 feet above sea level. That's, that's like a low flying airplane. The, yeah, the that... arc for, for what is it? Half a year, a full year after the flood that it's, that it's floating around. It's going to be in the clouds. It's going to be floating where Boeing jets are, are flying a, in a part of the, in a part of the atmosphere where there is much less, oxygen and it's very very cold everything on the ark would have either frozen or asphyxiated interesting it seems that a lot of these problems that we run into the only workaround for them is magic because god has to be god yeah has to be the magic uh the magical powers of god okay no um Fast forward a bit to Genesis 8, 5, talking about the mountaintops. As the waters started to recede, uh, the mountaintops became visible in Genesis 8, 5. Now, presumably that Noah would have had to have seen that 
in order for it to be recorded or or it's just God telling us that this is what happened because there's nobody else around. So if it was farther than 14 miles away, I think is the curvature, then he's not going to see it. And, and how would he know that the mountains are now visible? Mm. But um, what he did to find out if the if there was land yet as the, as the water start as the rain stopped and the water started to, to recede was he would sit these, the doves and ravens that you were talking about, he would send them out and, and see if they, uh, I guess, reported back. It's, it's a, it's an inefficient uh, method in determining whether or not the waters have gone down. He, he sends birds out and that seems to be as far as he's thought. Um, he, he, he can't, he can't see where the birds go. Otherwise, what's the point in sending them? Because you would be able to see the land. Um, he can't train them, presumably, to bring back information. And, and as far as I know, unless God intervenes with the magic again, um, birds don't have, don't have the ability to, to speak. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure the plan, but he does send the birds out in order to determine it's, it's what he's got. You know, he's working with what he has. So, so Genesis 8.5 says the mountains are visible as it receives. But then Genesis 8, 9, with the birds he lets out, they come back because there's no place for them to land. So they must not like the tops of the mountains. And maybe, maybe it's just pointy, pointy peak. And it's, it's very, just too very hard. Dead. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then in Genesis 8, 11, one of the, I believe is a dove, returns with an olive leaf. And he knows now that there's exposed land. Now, the problem that I see here is uh, it talks about when the flood comes in, everything was killed, it, it, every living thing. So this, and, and we would know now with the immense pressure and the lack of sunlight um, for over six months that all vegetation would have died. So this bird bringing back an olive leaf uh, begs, you know, asks like, what, from what tree did this leaf come from? Um, you know, in the uh, in the Quran, they have a version of the of the Noah story, um, and there are there are some discrepancies. But when when Noah sends out the the raven in the Quran. Um, it doesn't just come back without anything. It, it's not like it just fails and comes back. Um, it goes out and lands on some carrion and starts eating the carrion, and Noah gets mad at it and curses it for for like getting distracted. Oh. So there are dead animals either floating on the surface of the water or lodged somewhere where the bird can indeed land. Um. So then. This this uh, dove could have brought back an olive leaf from the flotsam and jetsam of the surface, and um, <laughs> and and then he's like, oh, good land, <laughs> it's not it's not there yet, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, We've got uh, a comment in the uh, in the chat here. Um, Zafara says it was one continent, and the mountains were not so high. They arose after the ice age, which was caused. By the flood. Um, that's a very, very interesting uh, attempt at, um, uh, at at explaining this. Of course, we're talking about in and around the Mediterranean, and then we're talking about uh, uh, Mount Ararat. Um, this is not far at all from the Himalayas. The Himalayas are the tallest mountains in the world, and they were formed when a large chunk of Africa, what we call the subcontinent of India, separated during the break apart of Pangaea and with some force over the course of quite some time smashed into Southern Asia, uh, becoming part of that continent. And in the process, buckling all of the land in that area and forming, um, uh, the, uh, the Himalaya mountain range. Yeah. And, um, in order for that, I mean, like you said, over millions of years, um, if that, you can imagine the speed that the that the plates would have been moving if it happened over the last four thousand years, or presumably over just a, a few hundred years right after the flood. 
too, too fast right. a movement. Um, she she followed that up with right that happened because of the flood. So uh, Pangea happened um, because of the flood. Okay. Um, we run into a, a slight problem here uh, just because uh, they know the name of the mountain and there was nobody around to right. name the mountain. It talks about what the, uh, what the people in the various regions knew that mountain to be named of. So before the flood, that mountain had a name for it to have had one when Noah recognized it. Um, uh, I know you're just, you're just playing apologist because you started a long time ago. I'm, I'm with you. This is, this is very, very helpful. Yeah. She's uh, um, she's not an actual Noah believer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, make that clear. Um, you bring up an interesting point, though. The Quran. I I, I was wondering if they did. I, I'm not as familiar with the Quran, and I, I know it's an Abrahamic religion, and I know that they follow Jesus. So I was wondering if they had a version of the Noah's flood, um, the Noivian flood, I believe it's called. But was there uh, flying horses? On the ark? Well, that is a fantastic question. Um, the flying horse, I, I assume you're referencing from near the end of uh, Muhammad's story that flies him to heaven, is not a terrestrial beast. It's supposed to be oh. kind of like um, Pegasus, like the horse of the gods. Uh, okay. it, it, it lives in heaven and comes down to get people. Oh, well, sure. That makes more sense. All right. Oh, y- y- right, right, right. Now, um, Okay, so the bird comes back with the olive leaf, and now he knows land. Eventually, he, he settles on Mount Ararat, and off they start unloading. We've made it, yay. And the first thing that Noah does is get busy sacrificing a bunch of those animals that he just saved from the flood. It's literally the first thing he does. The boat lands, he gets out, thinks, awesome, dry land, and starts killing the animals that he's been struggling so hard I, to keep alive. I think he hacks parts of the boat, right, and makes an altar. Sure. But, not going to need yeah, that anymore. Not going to need that anymore. But then immediately start uh, slaughtering and burning animals, and, and God is pleased with the smell of the, the cooking meat. So, um, yeah, just uh, seems a little counterproductive. Slightly, slightly counterproductive. Uh, now, for the for the for the sake of the apologists, we should we should say that uh, the traditional story is he brings the animals on board two by two, and every time you hear about um, or every time there's a there's a there's a portrayal of Noah's Ark, it's always like you know very very kid friendly, like two cute little elephants going on the boat, two giraffes and two birds and two alligators and whatnot, and they're all going in just uh, you know like a male and a female, just that's it going onto the boat. Um, according to the Bible, and it's a, it's a little it's a little confusing. It does suggest that um, he was only taking the animals two by two if the animals were unclean. Uh, unclean animals, um, even though we haven't yet gotten to the part where God says some animals are unclean, there were apparently still unclean animals. They just hadn't been defined as such yet. And unclean animals were taken on just two. Clean animals were taken on. Uh, seven by seven. Now we assume that since that would leave an odd, that would be an odd number, uh, which isn't very helpful in procreation. That that means fourteen of every kind of uh, clean animal. So you'd have fourteen elephants and fourteen giraffes uh, and so forth, uh, assuming that those are clean animals. And anything that's unclean would be the traditional two by two. So you would have that, a couple of extras to sacrifice. That's nice, and that helps with the the space problem that they have too. So. You, you know, two elephants, where do you store them? Fourteen elephants, not a problem. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, but speaking of the clean animals, though, so in Genesis 9-3, there's um, this passage where God says that um, all the things that move on the earth, you can eat. You can use it for meat. Everything that moves, you can use it for meat. And he goes on to clarify, it seems that, except for humans, you, you can't eat of your kind. You can't eat of other humans. He kind it's of nice, puts then. down, yeah, it, puts it, down it, a law on cannibalism right there. It's nice that post-global genocide, we do get our priorities right, and we do say that, that uh, <laughs> cannibalism is a no-no. That's, I appreciate that. But, but yeah, so... 
that's a good move on his part. It's going to help with the, the go forth and multiply a lot. But he says that we can eat anything that moves. And then, as you mentioned later, in Leviticus is where we start defining, no, actually, you can't. Right. The animals were divided into clean and unclean at this point. But it also says that you can eat anything. And then once you get to Leviticus, we learn that, uh, what is it? Uh, You've got swine, of course. Um, I think that turtles, like sea turtles, you're not supposed to eat those. Um, there are there are several um, other animals that are decidedly unclean, but the definitions of clean and unclean must have changed between Genesis and Leviticus. That is, yeah. So go ahead and eat it all. Never mind, I was wrong. Sort of like, never mind, I was wrong in making you in the first place, and I needed to kill you all. Uh, but then, so he's, he's done his sacrifice and it, and it gets a little crazy there after a bit where he just, uh, Noah just, uh, plants a vineyard and just drinks all the time, just gets drunk. Uh, we didn't really mention this. Noah was 600 years old when he built the ark. And then, um, after the ark landed, um, he lived another 350 years. And he Scott, died at you, the, the ripe old age of 950 years old. You and I haven't yet experienced this, but I've talked to people who are retired, and they often talk about how there's a listlessness. Uh, some people who retire find that in their old age, they feel like they're not that useful uh, anymore, and they don't know what to do, especially if they spent their whole life with, uh, with, a, with a job or a career. And so many of them will find some kind of hobby or, or volunteer work or something that they can do in their old age. So even into their 70s and maybe even 80s, they'll continue on doing this. So Noah being 600 and starting this kind of a pet project, I think, is uh, you know, just common sense. It's fitting. Like he had done the golf thing. <laughs> it bored him. The time to build a really big boat. <laughs> Zafara says that if she was 600 years old, she would drink all the time too. And I will grant you that much. Yeah, 600. Yeah, if I'm true. still around, I think uh, wine yeah. is about the only thing I'm going to – not to mention the PTSD of, holy shit, uh, everybody I've ever known has been brutally just, massacred by somebody I who I I know what you're it. saying, and I, I'm with you on the drinking part, but for Noah, he had to plant a vineyard and, and work it and then – you know, mash and then and then wait. I mean, that's a that seems like a, a, just another big project. How are you going to relax? But <laughs> he spends a lot of his time drunk and uh, naked, mm-hmm. and gets upset when his sons cover him up. This is why he's mad at one of them. But yeah, uh, he's cranky. At uh, is it Shem? Yeah. I think it is, yeah, because he he put the the he told the brothers, and then they put the blanket on him, and they put the blanket over him by like not facing him, and on like one on either side holding a blanket, and they walked backwards as the blanket covered him and dropped it, so they didn't see him naked. They were just told by the other, and that just made him really really mad that he saw him naked, and that he that he told the other too. How dare you? I I mean th- this is this is like you know, dad, this isn't uh, just a stranger and he's hammered, drunk and kind of asleep. I mean, right. and then again, then again, you just witnessed God kill everybody because of uh, crimes against God. So I might also take the extra precaution of walking backwards in case well, God. Is yeah, I suppose. Hour. But I mean, you know, I don't want to make it weird, but I- I've seen my dad's penis. It just happens as you're walking around the house when you're growing up. And as far as I know, he, he didn't want to punish me for all eternity and um, my offspring and their offspring and their offspring for it. You know, it was just like, Oh, he's coming out of the shower and I was in the hallway. Oh, Oh, can't unsee that. Your father is obviously a very wicked man. (laughs) That's true. That's true. But um, yeah, right around this time is when God's making a pact with Noah and he's saying, you know what? Sorry about that. Sorry about that whole killing everybody with the water thing. So I promise I'm never going to do that again. And to, uh, to always remember that promise, I'm going to set a rainbow in the sky. So every time it rains from now on, 
you will see this rainbow and it will remind you of the pact that I have with mankind moving forward that I will, I will never kill you guys with floods again. And um, I was wondering if there weren't rainbows before the flood, then it seems that when it rained, there weren't rainbows. So mm. did light refraction work differently prior to the Nuevian flood? Very good question. Yeah, if um, if God puts the rainbow in the sky for a particular reason, um, it would certainly stand to reason that it was that it was the first rainbow. Yeah, must not have been so, there before. Or it wouldn't have been remarkable been like, yeah. otherwise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one of those. If it's what God's promise, right? Then the rainbow would have, you know, especially since God is omniscient, He would know eventually I'm going to need this whole rainbow thing. So I'm not going to just, you know, no would be like, yeah, I've seen that a thousand times. That wasn't a promise before. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, I think you had a couple of questions that you wanted to ask about. Well, logistics I, of I, it. Logistically, okay. This is this is all kind of the common things. It's just it's just laughable to me when we try to break this down and say that this all happened. Okay, you've got all these animals on the boat. For at least six months, uh, I've often heard that they were on the boat for a full year. Um, what were the animals eating? Why were they not eating each other? How, once again, did they all fit on the boat? We know how big it was. The Bible, as always, breaks itself apart by trying to prove too much. It gives us the measurements, and then we're able to later figure out how many animals there are on the planet – and we can recognize that there is no way in hell you're getting even a sample of all of those animals onto this large by our standards. Granted, it's pretty big. It is not yes. nearly big enough. Why did the animals not eat each other on the boat? Okay. Uh, the only way to, to explain that is, um, well, God must have stopped them from, from, from doing so. Um, uh, so just a quick, some... to your point of food, Genesis six twenty one, and take thou unto thee all the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them, uh, speaking of the animals. So they were eating, and so was Noah and his family, and it was uh, a shared food that they were both going to be using. It doesn't specify what it is, at least in this version. So not only do we have all of these animals, but we've also brought along enough food for all of them to eat for a year, and the food doesn't get spoiled. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, just, just for a pair of lions, you're going to need tens of thousands of pounds of meat to get them through a year on a boat. That's, that's just one species. you got millions to go. Um. Okay, were the animals on the boat having sex with each other? That is, after all, why you chose them. You chose right. uh, males and females in order to put them on the boat so that they could procreate after the fact. Uh, were, they, were they procreating? Now, Zafara says, no, see, the animals hibernated. And I've heard this. I've heard this argument. Um, not all animals hibernate. Um, some animals do hibernate. Even the animals that do hibernate don't hibernate for full years. Uh, a bear can hibernate for four to six months, I think. Certainly not for a full year. Um, you, you have a lot of animals that don't hibernate. So we've pushed it back to the fact that they're hibernating. But the only way to get most of these animals to hibernate and to get the ones that do hibernate to hibernate long enough is magic. Again, you've got the that magic. there. Right, and then why says, bother mentioning that he's gathering food for them unless it's for after you after the flood because we know that there's no vegetation after the flood. So there's when not the be herbivores come land. off, there's nothing for them to eat, meaning they're going to die off, meaning nothing for the predators to eat. The the answer she just typed was no. God made them hibernate and sustain them. Okay, so we've gotten it to magic. He didn't sustain them though. He says right in Genesis, take some food. You're gonna need it. Take food for you, right. take food for the animals. So they, they are taking food for them. God's, God's not sustaining them. He's telling Noah to prepare to sustain them. 
Um, she also suggested that maybe uh, they brought baby animals and eggs. Very, very interesting. So this would also mm-hmm. require magic because uh, baby animals grow up. For most animals, it doesn't take a full year for them to grow to right. uh, the, the, an, an, a, a level of maturity that would require a full diet. Uh, eggs hatch or they go bad. Also, how did all of the baby animals get to the ark? Did they have all of the regular animals show up and then all give birth right outside the ark? Or were they all baby animals in their home? Like the kangaroos from Australia, were they babies there and then grew up on the way to the ark? Or did a pregnant kangaroo come to the ark and then give birth just in time for the baby to get on board the ark? Uh, That also would require them to not be infants because then they would need their mother's milk and their mothers were left behind. Um, Okay. Um, I heard reference. (laughs) <laughs> a little, a little bit of the, a little bit of the Cameron. You got to, so you got to circumnavigate the beliefs in fact in order to get all this in there. Um, okay, so I still haven't, I still haven't got an answer as to whether or not uh, animals were procreating on the boat. Now, if they were hibernating, uh, they wouldn't be procreating, and if they were babies, they might not be sexually mature yet. Of course, animals mature at different rates. Um, so I've heard, I've heard the argument that no, they didn't procreate. I think that there is one explanation that suggests that all of the pens on the ark had spikes pointing inward so that the animals couldn't get to each other. And that kept them physically from being able to procreate. Um, and, and I suppose you could, you could do something like that. You could keep them from procreating for the entire, uh, for the entire year. Now you already have an impossibility with how much space you need for all the animals. Now, on top of that, you're building in apparatus to, to separate, um, the animals and, and so forth, but, but okay. So if they aren't procreating, what happens to animals who have a lifespan shorter than a year? What about the fruit flies and all the other insects, most of whom live for right. anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of weeks, maybe a few months, they had to be procreating because they would drop dead. That's very true. That is a very good point. I, I had never considered that before. And and then the procreation, if the rate isn't slowed down at all or controlled by this magic that that has to be in, in control of everything, then you're going to end up with thousands more than you started with. And there already wasn't enough room. And uh, I also like to think of the, the insects. Um, what about termites on your wooden boat? One would think that would be a bit of a concern. You're relying on a wooden structure to survive, and you brought termites with you. It's another idea of not great for planning. There's a lot of problems here with the planning. Um, How are you getting the excrement off of the boat? We have a narrative in which the entire planet is covered in water. Where did all that water come from, and where did it go away to? That was enough water to cover the tallest mountains and cover the entire planet, killing everybody there. That's a lot of water. That's right. so and much all the water. water. Yeah, all the water that's here is, is already here. It's a finite resource. We've got the same amount of water. If you covered the planet in that much water, water is heavy. You would change the weight of the planet to the point of it altering its inertia around the sun. That's something I also never considered. It's too much weight. You have water appear out of nowhere and then disappear into nowhere. Um, You have all of the animals coming from all over the the, the planet, all making it to this one spot. Um, You've got... Um, the survival of just eight people and that being enough genetic diversity to repopulate the planet. You've got enough genetic diversity between two of unclean animals and 14 clean animals to repopulate the entire planet. That's an impossibility. You have nowhere near, it's, it's laughably impossible to get this many animals onto the boat in the first place. You've got a, built, a boat that probably couldn't have been built at this time with these resources in this part of the world, Ken Ham spent over a million dollars trying to recreate it, and he had modern tools and a workforce uh, in Kentucky. Um, you've right. got the inability of the animals to procreate, but they had to procreate. You've got keeping them alive so that they're not eating each other during this journey. 
so on and so forth. What did they all drink when they got off the boat? The entire planet is covered in ocean water. There's no fresh water left. Presumably some kind of a brackish uh, water. Uh, the Ken Ham thing, uh, uh, also, he, he, he would have had to have had investors, yeah? Right, to, yeah, uh, they collect all the money. Stuff. So when you, when you have something like that and you're building a structure, um, you would have to get flood insurance on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you would indeed. <laughs> you said that with such a perfect tone, I didn't even notice that it was a joke there for about a, for about a count of three. That was great. The, the point that, that uh, we're trying to demonstrate is not that uh, God couldn't do it. It's the fact that God would have had to have done it. So oh. God, at this point, you, you, can, you, can, you can't explain all of these things using science. In, in fact, there is this weird combination of, well, we can prove it. We can prove it. We can prove it. No, you can't. Well, where we can't, God intervened very well. Then you've pushed it all the way back to all of this actually happened in the real world, and God kept the planet from falling into the sun or leaving its orbit because of the extra weight. He disappeared the water and wished it into being. He kept all the animals from eating and fucking each other on the boat, so on and so forth. He was like the TARDIS. He made the inside of the ark bigger than the outside of the ark to fit all of the animals. It's all magic, 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 in which case – why did God bother with all of the technicalities of making him build a sound, seaworthy boat and using a flood to kill everybody? If you're going to use magic to suspend the laws of nature 14, 15 times in order to make this entire orchestra all work, why not just just kill everyone? Why not just, yeah, just disappear? You don't even have to kill them. Just make them not there anymore. Gone. And... Why didn't he know this was going to be the case beforehand? Uh, but uh, anyway, everybody, that's that's the topic. So uh, if you would please interact with me throughout the, the rest of this week and early into next week, up until the show Wednesday, uh, on Twitter at El Buterino, and uh, let me know your thoughts on the Noivian Flood, if you can defend it, please do. If you have more questions about it, please ask. Uh, and uh, let's, let's get the conversation going. Corey, do you have anything else? That just about does it for me as well. Uh, this, was, this was so much. I, I, I can tell already that ISM moving forward is going to be a lot of fun with Scott on board. We're going to do some more of these. They'll be a lot shorter during uh, future episodes. We are going to do an episode on Wednesday, and this is a bit of an introduction piece. Our episode on Wednesday will be at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be scoped. You'll be able to listen to it here as well. The subject of this Wednesday's episode will be sin. We're doing a full two-hour broadcast on the narrative of sin. It's going to be a lot of fun. We encourage everybody to join us for that. If you're enjoying the show, if you're, if you're, if you're getting entertainment, education, whatever out of this, we encourage you to go to patreon.com. Slash informed podcast. Give us a couple of bucks per episode. We sure do appreciate that. Follow us on Twitter, ISM Podcast underscore. He is Scott L. Dutorino. I am Corey at Dopinephrine. See you on Wednesday.